Sonic Free Comic Book Day 2014 issue. The cover says that all will be revealed in Sonic Comic Origins. But since this is by an uncreative writer, how could this possibly be as interesting as it looks? If this was by someone like Penders or any other writer before him, you would be thinking, this could be anything. And it turns out that's a complete lie anyways, as we'll see. I didn't even bother reading the second page. It's just a redundant wall of text. We start out with Sonic telling Sally to get down and preventing her from being hit by a laser from a Robotnik that clearly has black cyborg eyes. He's at least reminding me of how Robotnik tends to look. So, what was that about there being a mandate against showing up what's beneath Eggman's sunglasses? Because, sure, this isn't actually Eggman, but at this point it looks like Flynn's allowed to break all of them because he's Flynn. So the list of mandates I talked about seems to have had me worried for nothing because even the reboot doesn't seem to follow them. Maybe it's only IDW that's heavily restricted. A text box says that this is aboard the Sky Patrol in a training simulator, as some laughter plays. And Sonic says to Nicole that this exercise wasn't supposed to be mentally scarring. And Sally thanks Sonic for the save, which is obviously redundant and useless if it's just a computer simulation in a holodeck. At least it better all be a simulation. Or Nicole would have just uncharacteristically risked them being actually hurt. Why would she put real lasers there? So we're not even past the first proper page and already we've got another out of character moment. And an idiot ball all rolled into one. And why is the story called Sally the Exiled Leader? She'd never be exiled. Unless this is talking about the Mecha Sally bullshit that never happened in this universe. So far, the only things I like are that I love Sally's design. I mean, it looks like she has long hair, which is great because it makes her look more like a girl. But then why the fuck wasn't she looking this way in issue 256, which I read after this before checking the timeline? Why are they even still doing training simulations at this point? How long have they been freedom fighting? How many times am I gonna have to ask that before I get my answer? And why are only Sally and Sonic training? Actually, wouldn't the heroine in training, Cream, be the only one who training would make sense for? I only know this because of issue 257, which I read earlier. So already things feel forced. I don't even know what their general time in the simulation was like, because we started out in media res. The only thing that happened was that apparently Sally almost got hit by a laser because she was looking somewhere else for some reason. So this was here to set up Sally reflecting back to the time where there was peace because she knows the heroes haven't always done this sort of thing all the time. Couldn't we have just started out in the past with a text box saying it was the past? It looks like the first page was completely wasted on what can barely even qualify as a plot. Also, this has to take place chronologically after the whole memories arc, like issue 257. Because there, Sally's next to Sonic, no big deal, so they've already reunited with Sally. And... They're in the Sky Patrol, so they've already discovered it exists. So why was this released before issue 256? I'd be pretty confused if I had read it at the right time. Sally's narration from her thoughts says that growing up, you'd never know Sally's father was a king, and they laughed and played for hours on end, and she was never lonely and afraid. First of all, you would know that her father was a king, because she always wore a tiara back then. Hey, I have an idea. If you wanted to redesign Sally, why didn't you make her wear a tiara? Not to mention a skirt. I think I like her redesign and only hate the stupid shorts. I'm just saying that giving her a tiara would have been such an easy way to make her look more appealing. Anyways, not only did she wear a tiara, not only did her father always wear a crown, but they are famous as royalty. So everyone would know her father was a king on sight. Even ignoring that, her dialogue is implying that being a king means that in most circumstances, they wouldn't be super close. I guess that's realistic? What about being a king would mean he wouldn't want to spend a lot of time with his daughter? Well, that brings me to my next point. They are able to play for hours on end. I get that this is trying to be heartwarming, but this is the king we're talking about. Wouldn't he be too busy running the country to do this all the time? I immediately flashed back to Inishin Archie Sonic, where he explained that he usually doesn't have time for her when he visited the floating island with her. So far, this issue has been a confusing waste of time. It was nice to see a bit of the castle's flower garden, and see that she chased her father around for fun. 
I mean, that's good exercise. Then Sally's narration explains that she had never expected to have to lead so early, as we see her flashback where her father was holding her when she was a kid on the castle balcony. I guess he was addressing a crowd of people, but I can't see any. Then we see another flashback panel where she wakes up in Rosie's arms at night and she tells Sally to hush because they need to hurry. So it's gonna retread the backstory of Sally M instead of being creative, right? Well, I'd much rather him repeat a story that was written well than try to have a different backstory of his own and fail at it. Which would make the reboot look inferior. But I still can't help but wonder what the point is of telling us the same story again. Oh, I know. It's because he's only writing for the people who weren't familiar with the Sadie M backstory. Those are the only people who would get anything out of this. That's two pages that were wasted. The only thing original about this backstory so far is that Sally wasn't awake when Robotnik was taking over, and she woke up in Rosie's arms and she was already running out of the castle with her. That's a pointlessly minor change. We're told that not only was the king betrayed by his advisor, Eggman, why did he make Eggman his advisor? I guess because he knew Eggman was a genius and didn't care that he was a human because he's not racist against humans. Aren't the humans the enemies of his kingdom? What does it take to get hired as the advisor to royalty? Why do advisors even exist for royalty when they're not the ones in charge of running the country? I doubt Eggman was part of a noble family from his kingdom that would explain why he was trusted. I guess he just acted nice and, and that's why I trusted him. Anyways, not only had he been banished to another universe, but so had Ixus, who had been tricked too. And it's called the Special Zone instead of the actual name. Guys, this isn't creative. He just pointlessly called it a different name just because he's biased in favor of the games. To be fair, the name for the zone in Sadium was so forgettable compared to the zone of silence that I actually forgot it and took a paragraph to remember it. The void doesn't tell you anything about what it's like, but neither does the special zone. If you're gonna have a concept like the king being sent into the special zone, why aren't we being shown the king going through special stages? Wouldn't that have been an amusing visual gag, at least? Also, Sonic always manages to exit the special zone after going through a special stage, so if it's really the special zone that we know, the king would have immediately gotten out of it after going through a special stage, so it would be harmless to him. So it doesn't even make sense to call it the special zone because it's nothing like it. I want to know why the castle conveniently had a portal to the special zone just for Eggman to send him and the wizard away. If it was for vanishing criminals, why would it be in the most important and vulnerable place in the kingdom, the castle, where it was inevitable that anyone trying to usurp the royalty would throw the royalty into it because it's right there? Won't the portal be in a prison somewhere for the worst of criminals in lieu of the death penalty? Maybe it was, I'm not being told these details, but that would make sense. That would be smart writing, actually making a genius improvement. That would require creativity by changing things up, so I'm just going to assume it's just like Sadie M. I want to know why Eggman was able to easily banish a freaking wizard who had mopped the floor with them. Maybe he put crushed sleeping pills in Ixus's drink and threw him into the not zone of silence when he was asleep at night. That would make sense. I also run into the plot hole of why didn't Ixus take over the kingdom long before Eggman could have if he's a power hungry wizard? What was he waiting for? Wouldn't he have prevented Eggman from rising to power then? Why did he become their mere royal wizard and happily stay that way for a long time just to, I guess, change his mind about what job he wanted to have? I guess he only became the wizard for the sake of having a job to pay the rent and he wasn't qualified for anything else? I'm betting that'll never be explained either because even Archie didn't tell us. This issue sure is skipping on the vital details for an origin story that tells all. Basically all it's doing is telling you stuff you already know. The only new information is that he renamed the Void because he's biased, and he made Ixus going there make more sense. At least in theory. Because it made a lot more sense that he had been banished there like in Sad AM, than Archie's explanation that he went in there himself for no reason. But I can understand why Archie did that because he's a freaking wizard. Who would be powerful enough to get away with banishing him? Well, anyone could sneak up behind him when he's standing in front of an active portal and kick him into the portal. Eggman did that to Kodos. So we should have been shown this. But even then, it still feels contrived to me without explaining why in the world he was standing in front of an active portal in the first place. Even in Sadiem, 
I have no idea why he even went into the void in the first place, and trusted Eggman not to trap him there after he kept tormenting him by shapeshifting his head. He should have kept his head shapeshifted until after he'd come back from the void, give him an incentive to let him come back. So even in Sad M, it was poorly written because it was his own idiotic fault. I think the reason Codus was standing in front of the active portal was because he was telling Eggman about his plan to overthrow the king with them. And Eggman stupidly sent him away for the evils instead of working with them and overthrowing the king much faster, and then having him around to roboticize. Yeah, that was stupid, actually. He really didn't need to be the one who banished Kodos, instead of him being banished by soldiers for trying to overthrow the king. Like I always assumed. But I guess it wasn't forced that Eggman just impulsively did a mean thing without thinking because he didn't want to share power with them, without considering that he could keep him around and roboticize him later anyways. This story is so interesting that I wanted to talk about Archie and Sadie M instead. Maybe because they had more to them. They had a lot of actual information, as opposed to brief panels that barely tell you the basics. This story is for people too ignorant to know Sadie M's backstory, apparently. I guess the excuse is that it's from Sally's perspective, so she only knows so much. But what's the point of having it be only from her perspective unless barely telling you anything? It would make more sense for Eggman to want to work with Ixis and not banish him, because then he'd have a wizard on his side. But Ixis would have no reason to put up with Eggman. Why would Ixis think he needs Eggman around? So. That could be an explanation for why Eggman banished Ixis, because he knew Ixis would inevitably double-cross him. And Ixis thought that they were working together, so that's why he was surprised. I think Ixis is against technology, and therefore would be against Eggman. We're shown Chuck, Rosie, and Sally fleeing the castle in the night, while Textbox says that Badniks took over the castle. Actual Badniks? That all die in one hit? That fleet we showed that even regular civilians can smash? Swapbots made a lot more sense because they were bipedal, so they could hold ray guns and shoot them while actually aiming in a direction other than just immediately in front of them. Because they could move their arms around. Plus, when it came to Sad AM, we never saw anyone easily destroying and, and smashing and fighting Swapbots. So it was implied that they were invincible because even Sonic wasn't shown spin dashing through them. So that's another reason why they're much more dangerous than Badniks. Why the hell weren't we shown the exact Badniks that were used to overthrow the king? We didn't need to see them fleeing from the castle. That doesn't tell us anything we don't already know. We could at least see Eggman earning his victory. We could at least get a proper explanation for why he earned it with mere motorbugs and caterpillars. I guess he used his best Badniks, like shell crackers and slicers. I'm nitpicking here, any robots could intimidate and overthrow the royalty. I mean, it's not like we saw the royalty with guns, or bodyguards with guns near them, and... I guess, you have to assume that all of Eggman's robots are bulletproof. It's just the robots that can stand up on two feet sound more intimidating than cute-looking robots based on animals that the king is taller than. Again, this is just Flynn's game bias shining through, because he had no logical reason to make them badniks, and not the far less appealing Swapbots. I prefer Badniks most of the time, but Swapbots make more sense to use as soldiers in a legitimate army. We're told that they hid in the village Knothole, so it already existed as a village at the point where they ran away from the castle. That makes more sense, actually. The people didn't stand around having no place to actually live in while Knothole was being built. But what also makes sense is that the robots actually found Knothole when Sally was five. Of course they couldn't hide forever. Of course the robots would inevitably stumble into Knothole. It's not like Knothole was hidden away from Eggman in another universe whose portal was made by a wizard. The story tries to be inspiring as Sally says that despite them all being orphans and runaways, they didn't just give up and hide, but that wouldn't avenge the fallen, because apparently they were fallen in a kid's comic. And we cut ahead when she finishes up to them all being the age we know. So fuck showing us what exact age they were when they started being heroes apparently. This was so pointless. If they're telling us the backstories of the main characters, wouldn't showing us when exactly they started freedom fighting be mandatory? 
I'm assuming that the robots that found Knothole were destroyed by the military guarding the place. But one, they should have spotted the robots long before they'd be seen just outside of Sally's window. There would be soldiers patrolling the perimeter of Knothole constantly. If robots could get right up to a person's window whenever they wanted, even the window of the princess, why wouldn't everyone have gotten captured by now? Oh, we're not gonna explain that? You shouldn't be pushing ahead explaining things that need to be explained right away in an origin story. I wanted to see what happened next, but instead we get pointlessly shown the freedom fighters when they're older, when we already know they exist. Oh god, the narration says, we rescued my father. But do we actually see them rescuing her father? No! Instead, we see the heroes generically fighting robots in, Eggman in the Eggmobile. Why did he risk his life personally confronting his enemies in the Eggmobile? He's a dictator. Doesn't he have a job to do? How could an origin story just casually skip past telling us how they saved her father in narration? All it seems to tell us is pointless crap. We were shown how they saved the king and restored their kingdom in Archie. Even if it was a temporary victory because they just had to go back to the grim status quo for no reason. Which is only acceptable when the status quo is better. I'm assuming that we'll be showing all this more in detail later, but why not show it now? It's a free issue, so shouldn't they be assuming everyone would have it? So that's not an excuse to be lazy. Why did it just take so long to imprison the king to the point where Sonic just freed the king from Ixis in the first issue of the reboot? The only way it would make sense is if they freed Ixis much later than the king. Which would explain why Ixis waited for such a long time to overthrow the king to the point where he only got taken out of the city in the first issue of the reboot. The narration says that the heroes foiled Eggman's plans to conquer the world. I thought he was ruling the world. Most of it anyways. She should have been written to say, the rest of the world. It's not the games, can't you remember that for two seconds? Can't there be an actual plot to keep me engaged and interested? Instead, I've got literally nothing but plot holes and the same old shit to focus on. We're three pages in, and the story still hasn't actually started. Watching a bunch of flashbacks with one panel each with narration talking about it with a whole bunch of time skips in between is about as interesting to watch as watching paint dry. Didn't we already have this problem in, like, issue 165? She at least says that she loves her life, but doesn't that contradict earlier? The whole reason that she started recapping all this was because she angsted about the fact that she used to live in a time of peace. She wouldn't be angsting about a life she loves. She can't even keep continuity straight in the same issue. We see another flash forward where she comes to beg her father to let her stay with the Freedom Fighters. So was this right after she rescued the king? Time skips really are narrative damaging. You can't be that invested in the story when it never lingers long enough on any particular scene. The king at least shows he's a massive improvement by immediately agreeing to let Sally be a hero. Because she honors her kingdom with her heroism, go figure. It's better than him disbanding the Freedom Fighters because they're too young again. But it did make logical sense that her parents were overprotective of her and Archie. She was their daughter. And the princess. And they had already been separated before. She really is lucky that he's so open-minded this time and has faith in her. Even after his wife died in this universe, just because they can't use the Pender's concept of the king having a wife, but having Bunny and Antoine dating again is A-OK. -okay. They can't simply create a new character to be the king's wife who isn't made by Penders, but they'll create a new character to be the king just fine. From what I remember hearing, he doesn't even have the same name, meaning he's not the same character. I guess because he wasn't given a name in Sad AM, and they can't use preboot concepts and names anymore. Meanwhile, Lord Hood showed up just fine. Maybe the name King Max was by Penders. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'll be ready to bash his new name if it turns out to be awful. It is by a fanfiction writer, after all. Well, it was nice to see Sally hug him while shedding a tear. It was more sympathetic of the king to make this decision. So it's ultimately better writing to have him make the decision that's sympathetic to the audience. Instead of being an antagonist who proves that they never should have saved him from the zone of silence. I'm just not sure that makes logical sense, because obviously your team doesn't need her to be with them. I mean, he could tell her that she can keep giving them orders from a safe distance where she couldn't get hurt. He could have the princess protected and letter keeping a freedom fighter. 
Even then, Rotor and Tails are geniuses. And even Sonic can make good plans. So she isn't actually necessary to the team. The only thing she was actually necessary for, that only she was able to do, was be a love and trust to Sonic. And that's not allowed anymore, so there goes her unique gimmick. Like, anybody can argue with Sonic. It wouldn't actually matter if she at least stopped putting herself in danger. But he doesn't even make her compromise like that. It is better for Sally looking competent that she can keep being involved in the actual fights and dangers so she could do things aside from just making plans. That would have been boring. Also, considering that she was just shown to be so close with her father that she played with him for hours, why did she feel the need to get down on one knee and bow to him here? And at the same time, she's still calling him daddy. She was trying to be formal, but wouldn't she know to call him your highness then? Then we come back to the present where Sally thinks that while peace was good, she's found such great friends and wouldn't trade him for anything. So, in the reboot universe, she only found the Freedom Fighters as friends because she had to move to Knothole. That was what the first issue of Archie went with before it was retconned just to fit with Sally M and make Sally have a closer bond with Sonic as her childhood friend. But I think there are childhood friends in the reboot anyways. I did prefer the idea in Archie where they only became friends after Sally couldn't be with the king anymore. Because it makes more logical sense that she'd end up hanging out with commoners all the time only after she was forced out of the castle, considering that she had personal tutors. So she wouldn't have had a reason to spend time with Sonic in a school or anything. Then she thinks that she's found a great purpose, and she wouldn't trade it for anything. Sonic asks Sally if she's going to coordinate the team, but I'm just confused again because what team? I thought it was just them, in a training simulation. The background is extremely lazy, John Gray anime-style art that doesn't tell me where they are three times in a row. Am I actually expected to take this seriously? She asks him since when did he ever wait for her to make a plan first. And Sonic lampshades are taking so long to come up with one. So the writer knew it was out of character for her to start daydreaming. She tells him to start dodging attacks, hypocritically accusing him of dodging questions when she did it, and she tells him to cover her while she links up with Antoine and Bunny. As if they're apparently in the simulation too, not that we'll see them there in the issue. We didn't need them to be wasting their time training. This was the best they could come up with for an excuse to have a framing device? We didn't actually need a framing device wasting pages on us. Those pages could have been spent elaborating on the backstory we got so that we'd actually take it seriously. Instead of just confusing. It's too similar to Sadie M, and what it does change is so minor most of the time that it seems pointless to change it. All I can remember is that it makes more sense that Ixis was banished to another zone. It certainly made more sense in Sadie M, because Eggman had a reason to really hate Ixis. Because Ixis was treating him like dirt. And I remember the stupidity of the fact that robots were in the habit of finding people's houses in not whole, and yet everyone there wasn't roboticized. Which even Sadie Em didn't do. Also, how do you talk about the backstory of Sadie M again and not mention roboticization? Again, it's his game bias showing. There's no reason to exclude that. I can't help but feel like this origin story would have a lot more value if it was something original and really good. I would have been vested and interested in something unique because I was experiencing something new, and it looked like the writer was really trying. I at least vastly prefer the idea that Sally will take the throne someday instead of having an older brother steal her role as heir to the throne for no actual reason just to cause drama. Seriously, at least never needed to exist. But we already saw in the future of Archie Sonic that Sally is going to end up being the queen anyways, with no Elias to be found. Sonic says it's time to squash that giant bug, and I wonder why Nicole wasn't written to respond when Sonic had told her not to make their training simulation mentally scarring. I also remember being shocked that the words mentally scarring were in a Sonic comic that was trying to be for kids. If Sonic bothered trying to talk to Nicole, that would be because he was thinking she could hear him. So why did she apologize? Is anything not forced? Sonic runs away from a flying machine with Robotnik's face on it shaped like a bug, as the title then changes to Rotor. Exiled Inventor. First off, I wasn't told why Sally was exiled. And second, Rotor was never separated from Sonic. I could understand the exile part for Sally because it's a meta reference to the fact that she was separated from Sonic and Archie by being roboticized, and she felt bad about that in the reboot, even though that wasn't her. So it could be saying that she feels bad about it. 
even though it doesn't reference the idea that she remembers Archie. But Rotor was never separated from Sonic to the extent that Sally, Bunny, and Antoine were. And he doesn't literally get exiled by somebody in this issue. This is a stupid name theme that's impossible to take seriously, and I don't know why they thought it was a great idea. Actually, the titles are pretty ironic when you consider they were exiled from IDW. Tails tells Rotor what's clearly happening, so Rotor says that Sally must have a plan if she's regrouping with Antoine. Why didn't Rotor ever make an EMP device to knock out any robot machine in one hit? Well, come to think of it, that affect Nicole too, she was nearby. So never mind. Instead he wants to get a cannon working. Because a cannon was conveniently right there. Huh, that doesn't really prepare the heroes. I guess the legs of the machine is made of such tough metal that Sonic couldn't damage or destroy it with spin dashing at Sonic speed. So they put him in a training simulation where he could do literally nothing except save Sally because she was staring off into space and needed rescuing. Then Rotor thinks that while fighting Badnix is tough, he's faced tougher. Badnix? That's not a Badnix, that's too big and has Robotnik's face on it. How do you get that wrong? Anyways, Rotor angsts because of his new dark and gritty backstory. He thinks that when he was little, he didn't have much. Meaning, I guess he was poor because the writer doesn't like him. I think it's just because he's from one of the poles. Everyone there has to be poor! So he wanted to make the most of what he had. And we see him using a screwdriver even as a kid. Are we, are we gonna learn how he found out how to tinker with machines? No? And then we see his dad smack his machine away for no reason. Even though it should be obvious to anybody that a machine would be useful, and he's lucky to have a kid who could do this. So this writing's force as hell. Okay, I already heard he had an awful dad. And I came into this expecting to be more okay with it than I was. This is just shockingly mean-spirited and sick. This is a kid's comic. At first I saw the panels and I'm literally slapping Rotor. And it's not like you're giving an origin story to a villain, like Scourge or Miles where an abusive backstory would feel necessary to explain why he turned so bitter. This just isn't enjoyable. Instead of giving him a loving mother like Archie had, he suddenly has a complete monster for a father, with no loving parent in sight. If this was just a way to get the audience's sympathy, and that was the only reason it was written, yeah right, then that was a very easy, cheap way to do that, and wasn't necessary. Shouldn't the writer have known that we already sympathize with Rotor? Does he not? It's very obvious that the only reason this is suddenly the case for Rotor is because of meta logic. Flynn, the fanfiction writer, doesn't like him. And even the person who created Rotor is a character crew to hate him. So in the meta sense, the father of Rotor hates him in both cases. I can understand why you would dislike Rotor, because I've never been that impressed with him either, since he's just a boring, bland, nice, brave hero just like the rest of them. So he has basically no personality at all. He doesn't have a gimmick. The only thing that tries to contrast him from Tails, who's already a genius inventor, is that he's a walrus who's older than him. He's long since outlived his usefulness, because Tails is an engineer in the reboot from the start, when his purpose to begin with was to be the team engineer, and now he doesn't even have that. I never found him funny when they tried to make him comedic, and just made him make stupid puns or be an oblivious moron. Neither of that made sense. It makes more sense for him to be a tough guy because he's a walrus. So that's what Flynn's other M comic went with. And the minute we saw him in the reboot, he was fighting Badnix with his fist. How is that not a tough guy that his father would be proud of? I guess he wasn't always like that though, and that's why his father didn't like him? The problem is, what about him showing him a machine makes him a wuss? It'd be more understandable if you had him hate him for sucking at sports. Because I thought it was going to go with the obvious cliche, strong dad hates his wuss son. Even then, there's never been any indication he sucked at sports. Like when he played hockey and Archie. And we even saw him lift a barbell over his head. Things sure have changed. I can understand not liking Rotor because he's the definition of redundant. But hating Rotor is a completely different story. It's just that you look at this panel and it's so jarring for a kid's comic that this is happening to one of the main heroes of the comic. Of course this was written by Flynn. 
The same fan who wrote a gory fan comic for Sonic, where Rotor got drowned by chaos out of nowhere. Not to mention held a knife to Sonic's throat. It's so obvious to me that this would never fly in the earlier continuities. That no writer from before Flynn would ever want to do this. I don't like Rotor either, but that doesn't mean I would have wanted to make even his own parents hate him. Because it'd be common sense to me that his parents would be proud of him for being a genius. It takes a really spiteful writer to go with spite over actual logic. It wouldn't be so bad if we were given proper context and explanation instead of us only seeing two panels without any dialogue and no actual plot. If I was writing Scourge's parents, I would explain that the reason for why they were jerks to him was that he was an accident, so they saw him as just an inconvenience, while all they wanted to focus on was their jobs. So that's actually two reasons. And a third reason would be that he wasn't perfect. Like, he wouldn't have gotten perfect grades, so he couldn't make up for being born to them. I effortlessly thought of three different excuses for abusive parents, and all of those reasons could have been applied to Rhoda's father. But here, he's just a closed-minded monster to cause drama for no reason. All we're told is that his father didn't like newer, different things. And we see that he had an old-fashioned lance. What, just because he grew up in one of the poles? Like an old-fashioned Inuit? Flynn, you do realize that most Native Americans nowadays are just as modern as everyone else, right? And this has to be taking place in modern times, because Rotor can make machines and always had access to them. But just because his father's an Inuit, he's old-fashioned now? Uh, I can't even remember any walruses having lances before. I have a question. Why did Rotor ever have any machines around in his house that would spark his interest if his father was old-fashioned from living in an old-fashioned place? One he had never found any machines, but apparently they were a part of his father's daily life. Which makes it confusing that suddenly Rotor trying to make them better made him mad, when he was fine with having a toaster or whatever on its own. At least Rotor says they didn't always make machines better, just different. So of course his family would be mad at him for being a bumbling inventor, because he would screw up the machines they bought. And he had no right to screw up his own parents' machines. And it's realistic that he'd have gone through trial and error trying to be a good inventor as a kid. We should have been shown him screwing up the machines a bunch of times, and shown him being weak and unathletic. Not even good at hunting, which I'm sure his father does with that lance. Maybe the reason he'd suck at hunting would be that he was too good-natured and squeamish to agree to it. Show! Don't tell! This is the big problem that makes this issue suck. It needed to exist, but it needed to do better than this. It's trying to cram two characters' backstories into one issue. So we're told that Rotor left on his own, and it was really hard going on his own. I doubt it was just because he was attached to his father and hated having to leave him, so what this is trying to say instead is that his journey was hard. Are we gonna see all of his epic journey on his own? Are we gonna learn how the hell he managed to get all the way to Mopatropolis alone as a child? Nope. That would require effort and creativity. This writer has had so many plot holes, why would I assume that they would ever explain this? Realistically, he would have starved to death or dehydrated long before getting to his destination. Sadie M's better than this. We aren't told that he ran away with his father's money or credit card. And if he had, the police would have been sent after him and he would have been caught and put in jail. Did he do a bunch of odd jobs to financially support himself? First off, child labor laws would probably forbid that, but maybe people did let him mow their lawns for money, I don't know. Except how could anyone do that? He had hope because he had heard about Mopatropolis being the greatest city in the world because it's a Mary Sue-topia all over again. Just because it's the city we know about doesn't mean it has to be the greatest city ever. And by the time he got there, he found out it was conquered. And I guess it was literally just conquered because it still looks like a castle, just with an Eggman flag. It wasn't all grey and metallic and egg-shaped. What are the odds? He ran away at this specific time, instead of earlier. Anyways, he sure was lucky that he thought to go run through the nearest forest and search for a village that he never knew was supposed to exist. If even he could have known about it, then Eggman would have known about it and found it. So it just coincidentally stumbled into Knothole when Eggman failed to find that place and destroy it for five years straight in Sadie M. Also, how did he manage to get jobs to earn the money to support himself after Eggman had conquered the castle and started trying to roboticize everyone? 
Wouldn't everyone who could help him already be a robot and want to get him captured? I guess that's why in the reboot, Eggman didn't have the roboticizer right away when he overthrew the king. If he did, Rotor wouldn't have had a chance. He obviously would have been captured and roboticized during his solo trek to the knothole. If Rotor didn't get paid for mowing people's lawns and stuff, then he must have stolen stuff like food and water to make it through the journey. Also, I guess he used either books or the internet to find out how to even get to Mobotropolis exactly. The flashback completely cuts past the only part of Rhoda's new backstory that was both interesting and made us want to see more of it. This is the whole problem with the issue. Instead, it cuts ahead to meeting Sally just when those motorbugs from earlier showed up. So, I can only assume he pressed the button and that's how it died. Because, it cut past showing us how he killed those robots. Not to mention it cut past what he said when he first met Sally. Wouldn't Sonic destroying them have been simpler? At least the writer tried for once, because this is original, but it's bad original. So it's a downgrade from Sally M that clearly didn't need to be the case. The fact that it was not just a new backstory, but a new dark and gritty backstory, was just shameful because it was so obvious that it only happened from the writer's own bias. It, it actually makes more sense if Antoine was the one with the awful father. Because Antoine was a very hated character in Sadie M, a complete failure, and naturally his father would be embarrassed of having a cowardly wuss for a son. And we already saw in Archie that Antoine wanted his father to be proud of him and looked sad when he said Sonic's father must be proud of him. That's part of why this is so confusing. Why Rotor? Rotor's the least offensive of them all. I can't imagine that anyone would outright hate Rotor. Well, Sally and Antoine are controversial. So the fact that he wants to... So the fact that he wants to have even the most bland and offensive of them all, to have even him have this kind of treatment, that's really confusing. It'd be like making Bunny have an abusive parent, because she just is not hated. And she's the most universally loved of them all, so no reason to think he could get away with that. Except when he established that she had an uncle, she said that she didn't want things to end in another fight, and the fact that they were forced to be on opposite sides caused friction between them and made him yell at her. So it was implied that even Bunny had a difficult parental figure relationship. Bunny was implied to have run away from home because of a family member she didn't like, long before Rotor. He, he couldn't resist doing this again. And it was just as confusing and unnecessary with her. It just wasn't this obvious and jarring. Why is Sally the only one who has the really loving parent when she's got the most haters next to Antoine, and this is the same writer who killed her off twice and roboticized her? We're lucky he made his father so nice to her. So is it really that he's being mean to Rotor because he hates him? Because I think the Sally and Freedom Fighter he'd have to hate the most, other than Sally, would be Antoine. Not only did he put Antoine in a coma, but his original plan was to kill him. And he only spared him because he was surprised by the fan outcry when Sally was temporarily killed off. It goes to show you how he couldn't have possibly liked Sally if he was actually surprised that there was fan outcry. Like he couldn't imagine that she would be popular. So maybe it's not just out of dislike for Rotor, because then the same thing would have happened to Antoine. Maybe he thinks he couldn't get away with demonizing Sally's parent because he already got backlash for that in the preboot. At least I hope he did. Making the King nice was an easy, cheap, author-saving throw for him, giving him easy browning points. And then he could call it a day, apparently. And even he learned that Sally has a lot of genuine fans, so he knew he couldn't get away with it for Sally. Maybe Rotor has so few vocal fans that he thought he could get away with this with him. Maybe he didn't think he could get away with it for the most hated main hero inside the end because of all the fan outcry when Antoine was put into a coma, proving that even he has fans. But I haven't seen Antoine's parents in the reboot yet. It would make sense if we saw that Antoine had a mother in the reboot, because the excuse for Rotor not having a mother in the reboot has to be that he had a mother in the preboot. Antoine had a father in the preboot, but not a mother. Like, it would be the obvious idea to give Antoine a mother, but that would be nice to him. But it would be a lot more spiteful to have that mother be mean to him. By the way, Rotor's thoughts say that all of the survivors were hiding a knothole. So, did Eggman have a roboticizer back then or not? If so, then they should have told us that, because that's a really important part of Sadie M. And he's aping Sadie M's backstory anyways. If not, then that implies that literally everyone who didn't escape Mumbo Travel to Knothole was killed. 
Because they're called survivors. What's more dark and edgy? Being killed or botticized with the hope of eventually being brought back to normal? Yeah, obviously not better than Sadiam. I assumed this was just bad dialogue creating a misunderstanding. I always assumed that when we would have found out how Rhoda's father was to him, it would have made sense. And it would have been an actual plot where he had dialogue that could explain himself to the characters. And that would be the first time we meet him, with Sonic seeing him at the pole. What I got was much more simplistic and lazy. An entire page is wasted on telling us stuff we already know. Tails says he's got the wiring sorted out, getting Rotor to stop arbitrarily reflecting back on the past when Sally just did in the same hour. What a coincidence. Having the same framing device for all of the characters just makes it contrived. The fact that they're actually thinking back, in universe, all in the exact same scene. Wouldn't make more sense if they were at least reminiscing to each other out loud during a campfire or something? So they'd have a reason to be all talking about the past at once. I think what I expected was that they'd be telling us about their new backstories when they were still remembering Archie Sonic. So they would have a reason to reminisce because they're talking about their new memories. So Rotor destroys the machine in the simulation with one laser shot as Sonic had done basically nothing the whole time. And Sally had done literally nothing. I have a question. Why did Nicole put Sally in the simulation? I get Sonic because it was necessary to keep the machine focused on trying to attack him instead of Rotor and Tails, so he was just a distraction, and he's fast enough to avoid getting hit. Were we told that Sally was here to fight robots? Why would she be needed? There'd have to be something for everyone in the simulation to do, because it's a simulation. Tails says they're ready to move on to Gate 2. Then a text box says that the origin of the Freedom Fighters will continue in upcoming issues of a Sonic Super Special Magazine and the Sonic Super Digest. Yeah, because they wasted so many panels and pages on padding. Like the worthless, unnecessary training simulation that only existed to be an unnecessary framing device. What are the chances both Rotor and Sally would be reflecting on their childhood at the same time? I already summarized Sally's part of the story. This issue sucked because it suffered from a case of telling instead of showing. It constantly frustrated me by not explaining enough and leaving plot holes in the process. Rotor was given a needlessly dark and gritty backstory because his father hated him for an arbitrary forced reason. It doesn't bother to explain it, so I'm just left wondering why he made him have an abusive parent out of nowhere, when he's not a villain that you need to explain why he turned bitter to excuse evil actions. He's a hero anyways, so that was pointless. And we know he had a loving family in Archie, so this was an obvious downgrade. It's not like he's shown to have a loving mother, which would have felt less forced and having drama for no reason. There's no dialogue associated with this revelation to get you invested in the story by explaining both sides of the story and having an actual plot. In fact, most of the story is constant time skips not lingering enough on the scenes you want elaboration on, so you can't get truly invested without being pulled out of it and still having plot holes. This story could have bothered to tell us how Rotor got to Metropolis all on his own as a child, but instead it leaves a big plot hole gaping wide open. I didn't know it was possible to fuck up an issue about elaborating on the backstories of the main characters when we could have easily not had backstories for that extra bit of creative effort. So it seemed like a great idea on paper, but there was almost no effort put into it. And the one time he did try, his effort came from spite. Why Broder and not Antoine? Why even the least offensive freedom fighter of them all? Even he gets treated like this? It comes off as clueless and misaimed when it punishes the wrong person entirely. What would Rotor do to deserve this? Antoine was the worst part of Sad AM. Where's his karma? And we all know what controversial thing Sally's done, but she's got the best parent of them all? At least if it was Sally, it explained why she was so angsty and insecure. So there would be a purpose in universe by explaining something. But Rotor doesn't seem actually affected by his past, other than thinking it was tough, because he's still just as confident as ever, if more so. So if he's not even gonna angst about it, then there really is no point and it could've easily not been written because it's not even there to make you sympathize with him a lot of times by him angsting over it. He just has that one panel where he made to feel bad for him, and then it's right back to normal anyways. He seems like the most confident rotor of them all. You don't just have dark elements, you have to use dark elements. 
It's like when SEC ruined Sonic's reputation for an arc. It didn't cause him to have a sympathetic moment of vulnerability where he broke down crying and hugged Tails, which would have been actually relatable instead of jarringly taking us out of it with how much of a thick skin he had about it. He only shed a tear about it once, and I didn't even notice it at first. And most of the arc he was just annoyed, and so the audience was too. And Sally's backstory was almost the same, so what was the point?